Hello students, this is Dr. Crow and the topic is identifying mental health concerns. I know you all are required to observe this, but I truly believe you'll be grateful you have. Here are some serious questions I'd like you to just think about. They're very personal questions. Have any of you had someone in your family of origin who is mentally or emotionally ill? addicted to alcohol or drugs, or who committed suicide? Were any of you abused as a child by someone in your family, sexually or physically, or perhaps neglected? Could also have been by step-family members. Do any of you have someone in your family of creation who is mentally or emotionally ill, an alcoholic, addicted to drugs or potentially suicidal. It could be a spouse or partner. Could be your partner's children or family members. Could even be your own child. If you've survived all of that in families, how about your friends, your work associates, or your students? Have you ever had to live through a school shooting, a murder, a suicide, or even witnessing what an abused child looks like. And even if you've been fortunate enough to never have experienced any of this, just read the newspapers or listen to the TV news. There are mentally ill people all around us, in homes, in schools, the military, in places of worship, in businesses and corporations, in universities, in prisons, in the government, and homeless on the streets. In the United States today, every reputable research study has reached the same conclusion that 25 to 26 percent of all adults suffer from some form of mental or emotional illness. The same figure is true in the world population. That is one-fourth of everyone in our UT education program at UTA. This is not meant to be funny or disrespectful, but one of every four or five of you watching today has probably experienced, or maybe still is experiencing, some form of mental or emotional illness, even if it's a mild form. Mental illness is a huge issue. In your lifetime, particularly as an educator, you will see and have to deal with mental illness. Today I'll spend a few minutes with you to help you do the responsible and the legally correct thing as a teacher when you are able to identify the signs and symptoms. The reason we need to learn about mental illness is twofold. Number one, to break the stigma of silence and embarrassment. And number two, to provide help for those who need it. Now let's take a look at the new Texas law. I'm going to describe the new Texas law called Senate Bill 460. We'll talk about child abuse and neglect, suicide identification and prevention, and signs of mental and emotional health. Here's the new law. Anybody who is beginning their program of preparation to be a teacher in Texas must receive, as a part of the training, the ability to assert, identify and locate and get help for people with mental emotional disorders. When you're talking about child abuse and neglect, let's start with your legal obligation. If you think that child abuse or neglect has occurred, you are required by law to make a verbal report within 48 hours. And that's not something you can give someone else to do or turn it over to someone else. You personally must make a verbal report within 48 hours. 
If you fail to do this, there are significant legal consequences. Reporting it again to your principal, to your school counselor, or your superintendent is important, but will not satisfy your obligation under the law. One of the things you need to know to have some comfort with, your report of child abuse or neglect is confidential and immune from civil or criminal liability as long as the report is made in good faith and without malice. Provided these two conditions are met, you will also be immune from liability if you're asked to participate in any judicial proceeding that might result from your report. If you suspect abuse, do not try to investigate. That is not your job. Do not confront the abuser. Do report your reasonable suspicions. It is not up to you as a teacher to determine whether your suspicions are true. A trained investigator will evaluate the child's situation. Let's talk about physical abuse. What kinds of things might you notice in a school? Frequent injuries such as bruises, cuts, black eyes or burns, especially when a child is not able to explain how it happened. Burns or bruises in an unusual pattern that may indicate the use of an instrument or a human bite, maybe even cigarette burns. Frequent complaints by a child of pain without obvious injury, and perhaps even aggressive, disruptive, and destructive behavior on the part of the child. Lack of reaction to pain. Passive, withdrawn, emotionless behavior, almost as if a child has been traumatized. Fear of going home or seeing parents. Injuries that appear after the child has not been seen for several days. An unseasonable clothes that may hide injuries to arms and legs. Be particularly careful when a child in the middle of, say, cold or winter months is wearing clothing that does not uh, adequately reflect the season or when there is a summer time and the child is wearing heavy clothing that appears to be designed to cover wounds or problems with the body. Let's change now to warning signs of neglect. These might be less obvious but are necessary also. Obvious malnourishment, lack of personal cleanliness, torn or dirty clothing, obvious fatigue and listlessness, a child unattended for long periods of time. Need for glasses, dental care or other medical attention, stealing or begging for food, frequent absence or tardiness from school. We're going to switch to something that's difficult for all of us to even think about, and those are the warning signs of sexual abuse. Let me start by saying that there are three kinds of situations that involve sexual encounters that are illegal. One is child abuse, which is what we'll be talking about mostly today. And child abuse means the child is being abused or neglected by a custodian. And custodian is identified as someone who has responsibility for the child, like parents or family members or babysitters. If that child abuse is in the form of sexual abuse and by a family member, it can also be called incest. So one category of sexual encounters with a child would be 
sexual abuse, and that's under the category of child abuse. The second one is called rape. Rape is non-consensual and is not by a custodian. The third category is called statutory rape. This is consensual sex, but there is a three-year difference in age ages between the child and the person doing the consensual sex with them. Last comment is be aware that child sexual abuse can be consensual on the place on the on the part of the child, but that still means it's wrong. The child is not responsible even if the child appears to consent. Physical signs of sexually transmitted diseases Evidence of injury to the genital area. Difficulty sometimes in sitting or walking. Frequent expressions of sexual activity between adults and children. And pregnancy in a young girl. Extreme fear of being alone with adults, especially if of a particular gender, so that would mean that if the abuse has come from a female, the fear would be of females, and if it had come from a male, the fear might be from a male. Children making sexually suggestive, inappropriate, or promiscuous comments or behavior. Knowledge about sexual relations beyond what is appropriate for the child's age. And actually, even one child sexually victimizing another child or almost like reacting by acting out the sexual abuse on someone else. If you are the first person the child tells about sexual abuse, and that, by the way, is often a teacher, your testimony is called outcry witness and it may be especially important in future legal proceedings. If you are the person the child has first outcried to or spoken to, what you say the child told you is not considered hearsay, but is admissible evidence in a trial involving a sexual offense against a child. This exception applies only to the first person the child approaches, but again, be aware that is often a teacher. A couple of things that you might want to think about with regard to your own children. You are responsible for your child's safety. You are legally responsible for the care of your child. You must provide your own child with safe and adequate food, clothing, shelter, protection, medical care, and supervision, or else you must arrange for someone else to provide these things. Just be aware that failure to do so may be considered neglect. Let's talk about suicide identification and prevention. A very difficult topic to talk about and particularly when you think about children. Unfortunately the statistics indicate that it is if much more commonly it's thought of in children than most of us want to admit. Although my slide indicates that suicide is the third leading cause of death of young people between the ages of 15 and 24, actually that has changed. It is the second leading cause of death. The first is accidents. The third would be homicide. 5,000 young people complete suicide in the United States each year and there are approximately 10 youth suicides for every 100,000 youth. Each day, there are approximately 12 youth suicides. And every 2 hours and 11 minutes, 
A person under the age of 25 completes suicide. So if you want to think about it that way, in the time you've been listening today, perhaps someone has already committed suicide just in this piece of time. By the way, for ages 10 through 14, the younger children, suicide is the third cause of death. In the past 60 years, the suicide rate has quadrupled for males 15 to 24 and has doubled for females of the same age. For every completed suicide by youth, it is estimated that 100 to 200 attempts are made. That's really an important point in the sense that often children try and don't succeed or stop or someone stops them, but later on they go ahead and bring the act to completion. Firearms remain the most commonly used suicide method among youth, accounting for 49% of all completed suicides. From 1999 to 2004, a total of 13,257 suicide attempts were made in Texas alone and resulted in death. Over 2,000 of these deaths were children and young adults from 10 to 24 years of age. Sixteen percent of high school students think about it, nine percent attempt it, and three percent make a suicide attempt that does require medical attention. What are the warning signs that you should be aware of? Feelings of sadness or hopelessness, anxiety, a decline in school performance, loss of interest in social and sports activities. Wow, that's a big one. When you see a child change from an active person who participates, who suddenly does not, that's a warning sign. Sleeping too little or too much, changes in weight or appetite. Giving away treasured possessions. Inability to concentrate or think clearly. Discouragement about the future. An increase in drug or alcohol use. Talk of going away or wanting to end it all. By the way, it is a myth that children or potential suicide victims never mention it in advance. They often will give clues if people are only listening. Suddenly becoming very cheerful and happy after being depressed for a long time. Let me try to explain this. If a child has been placed on an antidepressant drug, um, sometimes that helps them clear their thinking. And once their thinking is clear, they are able to make a plan to commit suicide. Another reason is that they may become cheerful and happy after being depressed because they finally made up their mind that there is a solution to their pain. There are crisis lines available. You might want to note the lines on your screen and jot them down. I think the most important thing I'd like to leave you with this segment that you're watching is suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. You be the one with the eyes and the ears so that you can get help for the student. <laughs>